Millions of undocumented immigrants in the U.S. are bracing for raids and deportations. Sanctuary cities are pushing back against President Trump's executive orders on immigration. We will end the sanctuary cities that have resulted in so many needless deaths. The federal government is heading toward a confrontation with cities, colleges, and churches that have declared themselves sanctuaries for immigrants facing deportation. We will defend everybody, every man, woman, and child who's come here for a better life. But the government has faced resistance on immigration before. Sanctuary became a national issue 35 years ago when churches smuggled hundreds of refugees into the country. A kind of underground railroad run by church workers to help people fleeing from turmoil in Central America. Today, Sanctuary is exposing deep divisions in how Americans view the future of immigration. Sanctuary is an ancient, ancient tradition. Now, it may be more important than ever. Ni por la cabeza me pasó yo estar aquí en Santuario. Vine porque no hay otra decisión, no hay otra manera de cómo poder dar mi última pelea. Mi última pelea es esta. For the last nine months, Sixto Paz has been living downstairs in this church in Phoenix. He came here seeking sanctuary after he was ordered deported to Mexico because immigration agents try to avoid making arrests inside churches. He's in the country illegally, but he's also spent more than 20 years building a life here and has three kids who are U.S. citizens. Lo vine a hacer por mi familia, por mis hijas, por mi hijo, que todavía dependen de mí. Muy sencillo, amas a tus hijos, so vas a dejar tu propia familia tirada, no más para irte, no más porque un cueste. Te dice, ¿sabes qué? Te tienes que ir. We will stand between them and uh, the government agencies that uh, want to deport them. The church is part of a network of sanctuaries that have promised to shelter undocumented immigrants from deportation. They need someone to walk with them, to stand with them. We have a moral and religious obligation to stand against unjust laws. It's not the first time churches have taken a stand to protect immigrants. Sanctuary is the latest chapter of a conflict that started more than 30 years ago, when Guatemala and El Salvador were in the middle of violent civil wars. Death squads targeted political opponents, including union leaders like Patty Barceló's father, who was kidnapped and tortured by the Guatemalan military. He just disappeared. For months they had him. One night, my aunt's car pulled up, and I see this man, and he was skin and bones. He looked so old, and he called my name, but I ran from him because he did not look like my dad. The family fled the country, along with hundreds of thousands of refugees heading for the U.S. When one group of migrants nearly died crossing the border near Tucson, a local minister named John Fife got involved. They told me about death squads. They told me about uh, people who had been kidnapped and tortured. These were middle-class folks who were fleeing for their lives. Fife started helping migrants apply for political asylum, but he quickly ran into a problem. The government said they were economic migrants in search of better jobs. They come here for a better life. They come here for better jobs. Uh, but that doesn't entitle them to asylum. We'd take in people who had torture marks all over their body, and the immigration judge would order them deported the next day. Fife and a small group decided to take matters into their own hands, sneaking migrants across the border and hiding them in churches. I assumed it was illegal, but I could not claim to be a Christian and not be involved in trying to protect refugees' lives. One of the refugees was Patty Barceló. American church workers took her family across the border from Mexico. We walked and walked, and, and they said, once you have one foot on the other side, we will help you guys to 
have a new life, and they did. Afraid he might be arrested, Fife did something unexpected. He went public. If we were public with what we had been doing, then we might have a base of support. The major breakthrough occurred when uh, 60 Minutes called and said, can we film a border crossing? They crawled through a hole in a fence and dropped into a ditch. Several minutes later, they emerged onto a side street in Douglas, Arizona. We were inundated with phone calls. It is the concept of religious sanctuary, churches giving refuge to undocumented Salvadorans and Guatemalans. At least 100 sanctuaries are now open. 270 churches in 33 states using an underground network to smuggle aliens across the border. Colleges and universities got the idea. And then the cities. voted to make its city a sanctuary for illegal aliens. The national press just ate it up. They were appealing, they were doing a moral cause. For nearly three years, the sanctuary movement operated in the open, bringing Central Americans into the country, getting them immigration lawyers, and helping them start new lives. It was a dilemma for federal prosecutors like Melvin McDonald. Usually you're pursuing really bad people that have committed bad crimes. With the sanctuary movement, you had nuns, uh, rabbis, priests. After a while, it, I felt it was almost a farce. It went way beyond the religious argument that was being used to be a political statement. They were basically sticking their nose at law enforcement, saying, we don't care what your laws are. Sometimes you cannot love both God and the civil authority. Sometimes you have to make a choice. We're not going to let any group or organization, even if you're people on the cloth, go forward and defy the laws of the country. We're just not going to do it. U.S. immigration officers, federal agents, open the door. The government launched a 10-month undercover investigation to infiltrate the sanctuary movement. They sent paid informants and even uh, tape-recorded worship services in our churches. A file for sanctuary site information. When you use the sanctuary of a church to plan the breaking of laws, uh, I don't think that the sanctuary should be protected. Fife and other church workers were charged with smuggling and concealing undocumented immigrants. In the end, eight of them were convicted, but didn't serve any prison time. After religious groups filed a separate lawsuit, the government let hundreds of thousands of Central Americans reapply for asylum including Patty Barcelo. She went on to raise a family and work at a hospital in Tucson. We had an opportunity to stay here because of people that cared enough, because of people that wanted us to live. The sanctuary movement faded from the headlines for decades. But then... The sanctuary movement has reignited once again. By 2008, things had changed. It wasn't refugees seeking sanctuary. It was undocumented immigrants already living here trying to avoid deportation. And it wasn't just churches at the center of the controversy. The issue, so-called sanctuary cities. Dozens of cities across America that protect illegals and do not report them. Many so-called sanctuary cities, like Seattle, have taken a public stand by not asking about immigration status when they provide services, like education and medical care. These are our neighbors and we will continue to support our neighbors. That's what community is about. And with 11 million undocumented immigrants now in the country, some police departments have changed their approach to fighting crime. King County Sheriff's deputies don't ask who's here legally, and the county doesn't always cooperate with the federal government when it wants to deport people. I'll get dispatch out here and people don't want to talk. They're very edgy when they see the police. I just tell them. We're not immigration, we're not here to ask you if you're here legally or not, we don't care about that. If people are afraid to call the police because they're going to get deported, the chances are they're not going to report crimes, they're not gonna be good witnesses of crimes. And we have to have people that cooperate with their local police if we're gonna have any effect at all on the crime rate. I don't care where they were born, my responsibility is to keep them safe and I intend to do that. 
But in 2015, sanctuary cities helped fuel a national backlash against illegal immigration. Outrage about San Francisco's so-called sanctuary city policy. When an undocumented immigrant was released from the San Francisco jail and then arrested again for the killing of Catherine Steinle. Lopez Sanchez has seven prior felony convictions and has been deported to Mexico five times. Where was the sanctuary for Kate Steinle? Crimes committed by undocumented immigrants became a centerpiece of Donald Trump's presidential campaign. And while studies show immigrants are less likely to commit crimes than native-born citizens, the issue fanned a heated political debate about illegal immigration. Trump said Steinle's death was yet another example of why we must secure our border immediately. There is unquestionably this gigantic anti-immigrant feeling and backlash. There is a mass movement now that did not exist in the 80s to deport people in the country illegally. Bad ones are going out as I speak and as I've promised. While President campaign. Trump has hinted that he might soften his stance, since taking office, he's authorized a dramatic increase in deportations, including undocumented immigrants who haven't committed serious crimes. In response, hundreds of new churches are promising to give sanctuary again. 35 years after John Fife helped start the sanctuary movement. The uh, ancient tradition of sanctuary is going to be as viable uh, as it's been for thousands of years, and it may be more relevant than ever. More than 6,000 people have signed up to provide sanctuary, including 800 churches. It's deja vu all over again. Don't complain when somebody enforces the law just like we did in the 1980s. The political uncertainty leaves undocumented immigrants like Sixto Paz in limbo. He's still in sanctuary, but he knows he can't stay forever.